Today on a couple of pointers podcast, we're lucky enough to have Harris Kenny from Intro CRM. Welcome to the show. Hey, Ricky, good to speak with you. So, for the sake of the audience, just explain it like I'm five. What does Intro CRM do? Yeah, so we provide sales as a service, but that's a very broad thing. So, going into a little more detail, we support revenue teams. Typically, marketers are our customers, and we're helping them with handling inbound leads. And then to a lesser extent, we do outbound as well, but largely inbound driven. And so whether that's trade show lists, contact form, request for demo on the website, and we handle that fractionally. So we have an embedded rep working inside our client's CRM, typically HubSpot, and updating properties, importing lists. We do some projects, some HubSpot projects as needed to make sure everything's flowing. And our job really is for account executives to be busy. So in a perfect scenario, we're taking these small tasks off of their plate and allowing them to focus on closing deals. Oh man, I absolutely love the concept. I had someone reach out to me a month ago saying, hey, we're getting 200 inbound leads. Our marketing machine's humming. Of the 200 leads though, 140 of them are real trash. Of the 60, most are not going to convert like they X and then there's 20 gold within there, but they were really struggling to get through all 200 to find the 20. So talk to me about what does a customer normally look like before they come to you? Yeah, typically what's happening is leads are not being responded to. So you look and it'll be days, a week plus, sometimes there's not even certainty or clarity around, did anyone even get back to them at all? And be- because people are too busy, there's the pro- the challenge. So there's a couple of ways that people come in. They may have an administrative assistant or an operations type person who's keeping an eye on the inbox, but the- or they'll have account executives and closers doing it. And so there's different problems with those different ways of handling it. On the like admin side, those folks t- tend to not have sales experience and they tend to not understand the tools. So they tend to not know where you can automate and where you can use enrichment to make that job more efficient, how you can Mm -hmm. use templates and sequences and other tools to get back to people faster and spend less time on it because that's not their job really. And their job Mm -hmm. is to do everything. And then the closers are like, look, I don't have time to kick the tires on this because I have a real proposal I got to work on. And they are rationally saying, I need to focus on the thing that's closer to closing because that's my job. And, uh, but the problem is if you keep doing that, eventually the top of the funnel dries up. Yeah, it makes so much sense. What have you found? I just want to dig into this because there's so many companies not doing this right. They're spending money, getting people to their website, filling in their form and fuck it up. It's just, it's just waste. So where, like, where have you seen the biggest waste? Like what are some of the, the yeah, just where are companies wasting the inbound yeah. leads? Yeah, okay. I think that the biggest, the first thing that we do, and this is what we learned with a client who had really strict requirements. So we learn from our customers all the time. And we have got one in particular who I feel like is showing us the way. And I feel like they have a very strong marketer and they've got really strong traction. So like they're doing a lot right. And so we're really following them and working with them as they need things. And so they were like, look, we need to have these bigger customers. We need to have qualification. So they gave us a big long list. And so I boiled it down and said, look, if we're emailing back and forth, I need to get this down to two questions to know whether this is good or not good. Other questions on here, allow us to research that on our own, do our own enrichment, use clay or something like that to do individual enrichment. Because I think people see a really high ticket item like a clear bit and they say, okay, that's expensive or maybe they've never even heard of it. And you don't need to necessarily pay for all the enrichment in the world. It's just, can I get headcount? Can I get which department they're in? Can I get this person's LinkedIn? Just a couple of data points to make sure that they're generally a fit. So the biggest mistake I see people make is either not doing any qualification or having too many qualifications that are being done manually. And so if you can boil it down to one to two questions, you're going to be much more likely to get that person through the process. And then we do that asynchronously. And so we'll do that research and enrichment on our own in parallel to going back and forth to the prospect. And our promise to the prospect for our customers, their their customers, is if you work with us, if you play ball and help us understand these couple things about your business, your first conversation will be with someone who knows what they're talking about. I promise. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like if that- it's a fit, the person who you'll talk to will be an expert and that 30 minute conversation will be worth your time. And that's the second thing I think I see people making a mistake is they struggle with this stuff and they say, okay, let's just have an entry level person talk to everybody. And then a lot of people say, well, you don't know anything. Why are we talking if you don't know anything about why am I on the phone with you right now if you can't answer my questions? And people get- That's something we struggle with, right? That's one of the pain points of being a customer and having this SDR AE model is yeah. when the SDR calls you back and has to do that qualification. Now, I personally don't mind SDRs calling me for a quick qualification. I don't mind that. What I don't like is when I have to set a meeting right. to then meet the SDR, to then set a meeting for the AE, 
That kills me. If I fill in a form, 30 minutes later, my phone rings and it's an SDR. Hey, Ricky, you filled in the form. Awesome. I just want to understand what you're looking for so I can connect you into the right person within the company. You know, this, that, And then they run through a quick qualification. I don't mind that. I find that quite efficient. But like the pain of having to actually meet and deal with SDRs. I love that you're removing that. Yeah, yeah, I've had that experience too. And it's just, it's hard for everybody. And by the way, the real reason I think people hire us is that job sucks for the SDR too. They don't stay in that role because it's, a, an annoying job. Like one of the biggest things I think we solve is that like turnover and uncertainty and that loss of knowledge and the mm. lack of documentation. And yeah, we do the same on outbound and exactly. you're handling that for the inbound. And I also like that because it's handling the inbound, it fits so squarely under marketing. I always have to fight to have the outbound that I'm doing under marketing too. Yeah. The outbound really is where the marketing and sales crosses over, but you're a bit more into the into marketing. It's pretty square where it sits. Yeah. Now, what kind of volume do you find comp is it a volume thing are people stuffing up when they only have five leads a month or is it or is it only once they're getting to their 100 100 a month or whatever it might be that you find that quality really goes down that's an interesting question so i would say the first question is like what are the leads worth so if you have even if you only have 20 leads a month but if your average deal size is like 40 40 thousand or something like that. You, your ideal number of leads that you let slip is zero, right? Because you never know. And the other thing that's getting trickier about it is that the buying process is changing and increasingly, and we're definitely seeing this on our side. And this is where I think automation goes astray a little bit is that executives are increasingly delegating this to junior level people. Like literally entry level SDRs are the ones who are doing research on, and BDRs are doing research on tens of thousands of dollars in spend and software. And so if you have really rigid rules about how you're gonna route it or which ones are the most important ones, it's very easy to miss. Here's, it's so funny. I've done a lot of work in hardware over the years. So many engineers use their personal email addresses. Like at the biggest companies that you've ever heard of in terms of hardware. Yeah. And so the volume of question is a good one. I would just say in parallel, it's who those are. There's a lot of interesting things in there where there's weird edge cases that you wouldn't think it's that big deal. Oh, we only have a few a month and oh, these are Gmail addresses, who cares? Sometimes you don't know what you don't know. But yeah. I would say once you're getting, wherever it's the team is having a hard time keeping up. So like as few as five to 10 a week, if the team is having a hard time keeping up, that's where you want to think about it. And it may not be hiring us. Like it may just be implementing a better process on your side. Yeah. and implementing templates, implementing clear rules about what lead status you use. If mm -hmm. you're using HubSpot and having those trailing tasks, make sure they don't slip. But it's whenever leads aren't getting heard, hearing back like a day plus, that's when you start to have a problem, I think. So now what's some of the service level agreements or what are some of the timings that you've found are important? People are like, oh, if you don't get back to your inbound leads the same as they hit enter, you got five <laughs> seconds. If you don't call them in five seconds, they're gone. What have you actually seen in practice? How quickly do you need to get back to leads? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's like a game show. You go and the platform falls and you like get dunked in the water. You lose yeah. the lead forever. So when we first started doing this, my initial focus, I was really trying to follow research and see about speed. So my initial focus in the first version of this service was we were staffed up globally. So we had people literally around the world intentionally. I went on Upwork and I did geographic filters to make sure I had different time zones covered. And we were mm. applying around the clock to do as fast as possible. And we yeah. set up a whole system in, with SLAs and alerts and secondary alerts to make sure they're getting responded to quickly. And it was like after X number of minutes, it would alert the rest of the team. And it did work for sure. But what I found was that for our best clients, what they wanted was more context. So we have eased up a little bit in terms of how quickly we get back to people. It is mm -hmm. still important. We have our initial alarm goes off at an hour and the secondary alarm goes off at four hours and it does run 24 seven. And I keep an eye on things. I think our response times are still quite good, but they were lightning fast before and it was more triage. It was, mm -hmm. We were running it through front and we were just rapid response, getting back to people quickly. And what we found is that taking a little more time and asking better questions has definitely gotten better results. And so it's actually counter to a lot of the graphs that you'll see about response time. And I, we don't have enough data to really say that authoritatively, but I could just yeah. say from our experience and from what we're doing, that's what customers want. And it seems like that's what prospects want too. They want to have a little bit more of a contextual conversation and rather than just somebody who's immediately, hi, what's up? Who are you again? Why did you call? You know, and not knowing yeah, anything yeah. about them. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And maybe that five minute speed to lead is has originated from B2C. Mm. Right. Or lower ticker items where your product is the same as someone else's product. Often if you're selling a $40,000 product, yes, whoever they're talking to first must help. But ultimately, they probably got a good decision making criteria. 
in a good decision making yeah. process and they're looking to get in vendors to to understand like as yeah. long as you appear responsive that's important but then if you differentiate yourself by saying hey harris i had a look and this is what i've noticed about your company yeah. and you come to that conversation prepared with the case studies that look like there is asking the right questions you can differentiate yourself that way and that's probably a more impressive way to stand out D definitely yeah very well said i totally agree and i think it's interesting you're it's like first principles like you're drilling down and being like where did those studies even come from in the first place and it's funny because if you go look it up and i've spent time trying to find them you, so many of those statistics are recycled on blogs from content marketers and stuff but many of those studies about speed to lead are like years old like very yeah. old the market has and the study was first lot. done by some automation software that responded to your leads instantly <laughs> within five <laughs> yeah. seconds we did a study and we found that customers who respond within five seconds are far more likely to oh, and yeah, all totally. of it it's, it's like mars mars the chocolate company and they make a lot of dog food has done all the research on animal nutrition yeah all right so let's not get into conspiracy theories but we know a lot of information is product-led yeah yeah totally uh, i think uh, fundamentally like you said responsiveness totally do we want to get back to build a timely manner of course, and we do that and we try to do that. But is it in all cases, in every situation, the most important thing in our experience? No, and where I'm starting to look at automation on our side is what can we use? We're looking at Clay and connecting Clay up with HubSpot and using potentially GPT-3 and some other tools to do some of that research that you would do on your own as an SDR mm -hmm. or a BDR so you can have that information at your fingertips faster. There, yeah. Those are ways that I'm thinking about compressing response time rather than saying skip the context just rock at a yeah. response back. I, that's what I, okay, look, how do we compress the research? Time? Yeah, I like that a lot. And Clay is a perfect tool for something like that. Build out for each customer, a yeah. table that has their qualification and connected to their hub spots. And as a lead comes in, boom, automatically enriched and it's pushed something back to you. Do you yeah, build exactly. out the rest of the sequence typically in HubSpot? Do they need hubs? Do you handle that on your side and then push that back? Yeah, that's a good question. Right now, we are not requiring people have a certain tier for HubSpot. So if they don't have email sequences, we will just create trailing tasks and follow up. The customers for whom we're doing that, again, they have high, pretty high ticket offers. And so it gives us a chance to play around and customize a little bit of the copywriting. And yeah. You know, I think in the future, that's something we might think about, but so far that's not really hurting us. Yeah. Like where I'd like to go, and this is what we talked about a little bit in the past and where y'all are so good with phones. Like I want to figure out how we can do more with Omnichannel on these inbound leads so we can really get on their radar and help the salespeople do more social selling and help the prospect mm -hmm. then connect with that AE on LinkedIn. And yeah. what can we do to not just have a good handoff, but to try to really... Yeah. What gets a little bit harder is now the person on the phone needs a lot more context not just yeah. context of the lead and who the lead is but a lot more context of the business because if yes. they get asked a question and they're like i don't fucking know like it's fine it's good that they say i don't know but if they say i don't know three times they're going to be like this company does not sound like an expert yeah and i'm calling for help yeah yeah, yeah um, they seem like they don't know <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> so i guess keep saying that. yeah i get i guess there's uh and if they try to deflect to them not knowing they either have to own up and say hey look i'm just calling to you. i'm not all they can go it's my first week on the job you can't ask me too many questions i guess it'll bring up a whole range of other issues which i have no doubt he'll tackle yeah. and we do inbound leads but i know that's one of the challenges is the context of the business one interesting thing that we've seen, so in the beginning, when we, as we started doing this more contextual, like deeper work alongside our clients, they were, the sales reps were like, the account executives were like, hey, who are you? Why do you want access to my calendar? How come you get the first pass at these leads? I was used to that being abandoned and neglected so I could go in and cherry pick whatever I wanted and get back to them yeah. whenever I wanted. And now all of a sudden, so there was hesitation. And frankly, if I were in their shoes, I would have felt the same way. It, it, none of it was misplaced. Like it totally made sense. For time though, what we're seeing is that relationship is getting a lot stronger. First of all, they love just having these meetings on their calendar and yeah. we're syncing everything into the CRM so they can see all the notes and they can see all that because it's email only, it's all in there. And we're increasingly seeing that they're now kicking stuff back to us where they're like, look, I went to a show and I got a bunch of cards. Could you run this through your sequence and follow up on them for me? Yeah. And hey, this oh, account man. I talked to a year ago, yeah. would you mind? And so now it's feeling like reciprocal. And so sometimes if I have to call in a favor and say, look, this person just will not give me this qualification stuff over email, would you mind giving all? They're like, yeah, sure. No problem. Yeah. I'll hop on the phone. I'll see if I can get a phone. Yeah, That's you've taken so much that. work off their plate. 
Yeah. Actual trade shows. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen someone spend a fuck ton of money. I think that's the official price of trade shows. That's and to go and get business cards, leads, and or a list from the show, or they'll scrape the vendors or something and then be like, oh, let's do something with this. Let's do it. We're definitely gonna do it. We're hundred percent gonna do it and then not do it. I mean, probably more often than not, right? It is funny you say that because I have in my mind been like, do I just do trade shows? Because we did a thing for a client where they had a list of trade show leads. It was 58 leads. We seg I did a video on YouTube about it. We segmented the list and we did a generic trade show type email. And then we did a segmented one with multiple points of personalization. We found if they were hiring, it was really, it was a really solid email, I think. I was proud of it. Yeah. And the difference in response rate was 2% versus 27% between the two different ways of handling it. So I think not only did they not get back to them at all, it's like, what if they got back to them? What would that look like in terms of getting that yeah. return? Because it's like, you're so close. You've already talked to them before, or you've got their address, you've got their information. Like yeah. you're just so close to then not follow up because of process or people are busy. It's just... Yeah. And then to be putting pressure on an outbound agency or on Google AdWords or whatever to go find and more people. I don't know. Do you use other forms of, of sales collateral or marketing collateral? Do you have your customers record a little intro video or like how important is that? Everyone seems to like have that as, oh, we're going to need a one pager or we need a video. Has that yeah. been important getting back to you inbound lead? I think today it's not necessary, but I think that over time, it's going to be more important, especially for higher ticket items where you're really trying to equip your champion to have the information that they need. We had an interview that I don't, it hasn't been published yet, but this guy was an expert in communication and he talks about how people often retain 10% of the things that you tell them. And then if that's your champion and then they're going and having a meeting over a video call with five other people on a buying committee or whatever, and they're each only retaining 10%. It's there's like nothing left, right? There's 1% retention. And so I think that as we go forward, better sales teams are going to do it and it's going to force others, others who aren't doing it, I think are going to start to fall behind. I think today you can still get away with not having a digital sales room, not having strong collateral. You can get away with just having a checkbox of, hey, see attached PDF, they skim yeah. it, they ignore it, but it was there so they know it exists. But I do think that over the next couple of years that I think that is going to change and the bar is going to go up. I need to get better there. People often say, could you send me a one pager? I'm like, I'm going to go to my website and I'm going to click print. You know, <laughs> yeah. Like, like yeah. That's the information, all the information that is relevant I've put up on the websites. Sometimes it's an indicator that a lead isn't qualified or isn't really paying attention or isn't doing the research. Like sometimes they want that, but it's not. Yeah, I get it. Like listen, some people, objection. And they live in their inbox and it makes sense. Like some websites are so convoluted. Anyway, I get it. It's just probably something I need to get better at as well. I'll do a video instead. Now, I've got so many questions on inbound, but all this has been great. If someone wasn't doing something right at the moment, is, do you think it's better to just automate an inbound sequence that as somebody fills out a web, web form, because I imagine most are doing this. Somebody fills out a web form, they get an automatic email. And then if they don't respond to that email, they get another automatic email. That's a feature with most, you can do basic zaps or I don't know, most sales engagement platforms, most CRMs, you can achieve yeah. that. Yeah. Why not do that? Or why use you overdoing that? Sure. I would say that probably for a lot of people, that is a really good first step. And if you don't need that human in the loop looking and seeing, hey, this lead is really interesting, or you, the way you could automate it and like a stage one of this would be, you do automate that sequence. And then maybe you do an email notification to a rep to do a human review, but they know that it's not time sensitive because they can review it at their own leisure basically, and then get back to them when, it, if they think it's interesting, do an omni-channel, pick up the phone or get on LinkedIn or do a Slack alert. I think that's a really good way of starting it. I would say where we start to add more value is when you have the complexity that comes in of supporting maybe multiple reps, having shifting qualification criteria where maybe marketing is looking for tighter feedback loops. So marketing is really our customer, even though we're serving the sales team, marketing is using the properties and stuff that we're updating to inform their campaigns. And we'll run validation on lists and we'll report back and show them, hey, this is what that trade show attendee list or whatever actually looked like versus maybe what you thought it was. And so then they'll change their future decisions based on that. So I would say that where it becomes more of like a multiplayer game is where I think the things that we do are more valuable. If it's just a function of, hi person, thanks for reaching out. Yeah, I think you probably don't need to work with us, honestly. And I do think I would automate that. For yeah, that, that sounds great. Quick little question on trade shows. 
trade shows are a little bit different when it comes to speed to lead and somebody filling in an inquiry on your website. When do you find getting back to leads from a trade show to be most effective? What time frame from the trade show? Let's say it's a three day long trade show. This is a name collected on day one. Yeah, I think you want to get back to people as quickly as possible but having to recognize that like they're gonna be getting other things. And so if it's like a generic marketing email versus an email that looks like it was written by a sales rep, that's plain text, a couple sentences with a reference to something that happened at the show or something about their company, that second email is way better. The HTML formatted with a table and an image and a video and a picture of the team in front of the booth, those most of the time, I think are just not even worth sending at all because there's nothing, well, you're not really saying anything to them. You're just like acknowledging that they stopped by. Yeah, and they're like, yeah, I was at the show. I know I stopped by, I stopped by <laughs> yeah. everywhere. Yeah, um, yeah. A lot of people will get cold email too. Hotel vendors and other companies will buy those lists. And so they're getting tons of email. I would say like a little, in my experience, thing to think about is in those subject lines, like for big trade shows, not using the trade show subject line or trade show name in the subject line, because there's a really good chance that for bigger shows, they're getting tons of spam from hotel vendors and rental car vendors and I don't know, all sorts of people, print shops using that CES. or So there's other ways I would say other, because people's mental filters kick in and they're like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, this is another somebody just in Yeah, yeah, that's super interesting, right? Like you had this 2% response rates to a, a blank templated email and you had a 27 response rate to a personalized one. The difference between 2% and 27% is massive when you're oh, talking yeah. about trade show leads. And similarly, the time and the, it just makes so much sense to work with a company like yours. You're investing that, that net dollar value on a trade show, that fuck ton of dollars. To not have good follow-up is like, figure out your follow-up before you do the trade show. I love that. Yeah, yeah. Think, yeah think from the end backwards, totally. Yeah, because that's all it's about. I'm only at the trade show to start these conversations. And totally. if you're not at the trade show to start the conversations, sure, just invest your money in how you look. It's a branding exercise, yeah, yep. no problem. But yep. that does seem like a waste. Yep. Tell me if this theory is good. I've always thought if you're doing a trade show, you either want to be first in their inbox or last in, in their inbox. I'm almost like follow up on the day, like literally whilst they're walking around that night when they get back to the hotel, it's there. Like they haven't got the noise yet because like three days after the trade show, it's the hundred emails. So it's like an hour after they visited your booth or two weeks later. Yeah. I like it. I like it. I think the most important thing is what you say, right? So that initial email could just be, hey, it was really nice meeting you. Look forward to staying in touch. But we have a customer who I think is doing this really well where they're tapping into industry trends in that messaging. So mm -hmm. like their product has a new sustainability module and they're not just saying, here's our new feature. They're referencing, look, we had a breakout event or a happy hour where, where this guest speaker came and talked about sustainability in this industry. And of course, this is now built into our product as well, but you're tapping into the stuff that they're thinking about in general when they're at the show, when they're talking to their peers and they're in the talk panels, they're not necessarily thinking about features of software or whatever. They are <laughs> thinking they're there for getting caught up on the current events. And so I've found that clients who are able to tap into that and speak to that in their follow-up are able to it's not like a chameleon but you're able to show that you understand you're yeah. there thinking about and talking about the same things that they are instead of mm. just being a distraction it's like talking to another person you can have an interesting conversation or you can have a boring benign conversation and if you're able to show something that's interesting and irrelevant as if you were having a conversation it's not just about showing you clever you can walk up to yeah. a random person they can talk about things that show that they're clever you're like but i'm not interested so uh, finally when you and i'm just trying to like understand the difference between an outbound email. I actually have another question for you on outbound, but I, an outbound email and this response to an inbound lead, are you as strict with word counts, with not including links and things like that? Because often, are there like delivery issues? I guess they filled out a form on your website, but their mail server doesn't know that. So your first email still needs to be delivered. So like, what are some of those similarities or differences? Totally. So we take a lot of principles from outbound and do apply them to inbound. We do try to keep it relatively short because so if they, because if they just filled out the form on a website and let's say this company has never been in touch with you before, there is no relationship between their accounts and your accounts. And a lot of the, the way a lot of these tools work is like you just get a notification of a contact form. And then when you go to reach out to them, you're starting a net new email, which is a cold email technically from your CRM. So we do try to follow those rules and we'll make sure that clients have the DNS stuff set up that all the outbound people know. And we do keep it simple on follow-ups. We'll include more 
I would say we, we can let the word count go a little bit longer if needed. We can assume more is the biggest thing, I think, with when a lead comes inbound. You can ask more like leading questions, basically like what is happening in your business that caused you to reach out to us? Because obviously you're the one that started this conversation. And that the biggest difference, I think, between outbound and inbound in terms of messaging. Brilliant, brilliant. We do a lot of similar stuff for the same reasons. And then honestly, like the biggest thing is we'll just talk to the marketers and make sure that they're not torching the Because yeah. <laughs> many know, but many don't. If email deliverability is one of those things. I'll still go to an organization and go, who owns this? Yep. And I'll be like, IT. And I'll go to IT and be like, what are you? They're like, your email inbox is set up. You know your username and you know your fucking password. You can log into your inbox. Yeah. My job's fucking done here. <laughs> no, yeah. What are you talking about? Nobody owns this. This has just been so insightful. This world of responding to inbound is so important. And you did mention at the beginning, you do a little bit of outbound. Would that be like outbound to a lead list before an event? And then the intention is to capture them inbound afterwards? Yeah, it could be any number of things. And we've spent a lot of time doing just pure outbound campaigns over the last couple of years. And I think we're increasingly getting better results as we're adopting better and better practices. But where we're able to get the best results and where I think it's the best fit with our competency and my experience and just our tech stack and stuff like that is where I don't have a catchy name for it, <laughs> but it's like inbound informed outbound. So what'll happen is like you see three leads come in. This is a real story from a real client. Three leads came in all referencing a competitor. And so our team, cause that's their whole job is, hey, that's weird, why? So we asked them, hey, by the way, a couple other people mentioned them today is what's going on. And they said, oh, price is growing up by 8x. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I can see why you're shopping around. And then it's okay, let's build a list based on that inbound event that just happened, that signal that just prompted us to yeah. run an outbound campaign, but we're using that inbound context or signal to drive that outbound campaign. So I would so say- clever. For, It's so yeah, clever. And any marketer listening to this would be like, of course. <laughs> and at the same time, any marketers, yeah, of course I know that, but of course I'm not going to fucking get to it. It's yeah, just they, don't, the, they don't have just, time to build the list. They don't have the dedicated domain ready. Exactly. It's just over the cusp of, in order for me to do that, and that is obvious, I need to do these three things first. Exactly. And I'm just never getting around to those three things. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, I, and, right. and then, then it's like, who's see... going to handle the replies too? It's yeah. like, because those are more speculative. Like you're going to get some, like when we ran that campaign, we had a lot of people come back that weren't big enough, that were not qualified. And, but we had a couple that were, and one of them closed. And so it's cool. It's worth it. No skin off our back. We're not upset about it because that's our whole job. It didn't cost us. Yeah. We didn't lose any big deals because we were working on this lower, higher risk or lower probability campaign. Of course, um, outbound, they, yeah, there's a lot of different qualifications when it comes to outbounds and differences to inbound. And people don't appreciate the amount of work that there still is in filtering out unqualified leads. So right, this is like, it really has been incredibly insightful because it's a world that's adjacent to what I do and yet so different. It, it is a different world. It reminds me of when I went to Japan and you walk into this extreme extremely advanced culture so advanced I mean, like older than western cultures by far but so different it was if like the same things were put in the you know, western culture and japanese culture were put in two separate petri dishes this yeah. culture's been developing much longer so it's but completely different yeah and i find that's that's this inbound outbound for me at the moment i would say these principles apply to outbound i get cold emails and I respond to them every once in a while if it catches my eye and people don't get back to me. I bet <laughs> I'm interested in your thing. Tell me about it. Give, give me the pitch. I'm not saying like dance or whatever. I'm saying like, tell me what you do. I'm okay. And a surprising amount of the time people never respond. I'm like, what are you doing? I'm yeah, like, there's a separation. There's an agency doing the outbound, but then they're leaving it for the customer to handle positive replies. And the customer's not set up, which is why they went to an agency to begin with. It makes us, yeah, that makes sense. Anyway, but this has just been incredibly insightful. I could keep going, but I want to respect respect your time and get my kids off to school. But uh, I've still got a lot to learn from you and I'd love to, we should do something sometime. I'd love to peek under the hood and yeah. see the engine. Yeah, totally. It's probably more duct tape and paper clips and rubber bands than I'd like. But yeah, man, absolutely. And just likewise, I'm a huge fan of your work and learn a ton from you too. I think there's so much room in this space. There's so much room for so many people to do better with this revenue stuff. There's just a lot more to be gained by sharing and talking about what we're doing instead of keeping it in and being secret and assuming that everyone else doesn't know what they're doing. But I assume that half, half the world, marketing experts, sales experts know a lot more than what I'm doing. It's sure I've developed some expertise, but what I've realized 
in marketing and in sales, the key, the real skill is a capability of execution. And we've built that machine that can execute effectively. What it executes on, I'm happy to take advice from every expert in the world. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I appreciate that. Team in action. I've seen your folks on LinkedIn and stuff. You've, you're, yeah, the, you're, doing a, you're doing a hell of a good job. And I, it's a really privilege to be on the show and I appreciate the opportunity. So thank you. All right, man. We'll, we'll chat again soon. All right, cool.